Good afternoon. Um, I'm Deborah Wynn Smith. I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness in Washington, D.C., and I want to welcome you all to what's going to be a fantastic discussion on the drivers and challenges of U.S. competitiveness. Uh, we have a great group of uh, leaders um, in the United States that are uh, going to be sharing their perspective. Uh, let me introduce them. They're all members of the council. Uh, let me first introduce Dr. Kimberly Boudel, who's the director of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. She leads a workforce of about 7,400 employees and manages about 2.7 billion. And Lawrence Livermore is a tremendous leader in national security and the frontiers of innovative, disruptive technologies. And thank you, Dr. Boudel, for joining us. Um, let me introduce uh, Greg Hill, who's the president and chief operating officer of PESH. PESH uh, Energy is a leader in oil and gas. They are a leader in shale and one of the largest producers. Um, Greg has had a tremendous uh, career in the energy uh, business with all over the world with Shell and other companies. And of course, uh, we're gonna be very excited to hear what he says about uh, US energy security and independence. And He's also a commissioner in our National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers, as is Dr. Budell. And now I'm introducing um, Nolan Pike. He's the CEO of Electrolux of North America. That's a $4.6 billion company of more than 12,000, up really almost 13,000 employees working across research and development, design, factories, and sales across this continent. <clears throat> also um, has a tremendous background in advanced manufacturing, having been at GE and Sears. And so I, I think I have a superb um, group of leaders to discuss these issues around uh, the future drivers of competitiveness. I'll just make a few framing remarks as we uh, come out of the, the global pandemic and how this is going to shape our uh, competitiveness in the United States, as well as our leadership in the world. Uh, we've seen just in recent weeks, of course, how we're in a global competition for the future in terms of uh, democracy and uh, leadership in terms of values. But we also are on a huge uh, global competition journey in terms of technological innovation, the prosperity, the standard of living we will deliver to our citizens in the U.S. and around the world. Um, we all are living in these unprecedented revolutions in science and technology that are converging and colliding um, the digital transformation that has enabled us to, to function and, work and, and and move forward during the pandemic, uh, the biotech revolution, which enabled us to design and manufacture and warp speed the uh, vaccines to the COVID-19. And we're very proud in the United States of our, our leadership in that arena. Um, clearly, the, the, the revolutions in nanotechnology that are enabling us to have huge transformations in advanced materials as well as healthcare across every dimension, energy as well. And then what I would call the cognitive revolutions that are taking us again in this convergence into the worlds of, of AI and, and human um, thought, autonomy, all these things that we're living with that will create new jobs, services, products that we can't even imagine today. The US has tremendous strengths. We are still the world's largest investor in R&D, accounting for 27% of global R&D. We invest about $657 billion annually. That's $130 billion more than China, but we know they are the fast, fast uh, mover in terms of, of, re of research and development. We also have this tremendous uh, investment in basic research, and it's these long-term investments that have led to the innovations I referred to earlier. Again, we have great legislation underway in Congress, the, the bipartisan Senate, um, legislation that has passed, uh, the USICA Act, and we're looking forward to a bipartisan bill in, in the House that will propel us in this innovation journey. We have tremendous venture capital, and of course, our tremendous assets, these treasures of our great research universities, our liberal arts universities, our community colleges, and our national laboratories that are a crown jewel that no country in the world can surpass. But we have many challenges ahead, and in terms of talent, inclusive prosperity, and many other things that we want to discuss today. Do we have the most uh, business-friendly environment in the United States? Our regulations, our tax structures to enable the long-term investments. Are we going to be able to 
develop, deploy, and manufacture at scale the next generation of semiconductors that underpin the entire uh, component of the digital age that we are living in now. So we're going to discuss these issues, but I want each of our great panelists to maybe start with a key question, what they believe from their perspective are some of these overarching drivers and critical issues for U.S. competitiveness, and then we can dive down um, a little faster. So let me first call on you, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Budell, um, to give your perspective from the preeminent Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Thanks, Deborah, and thanks for asking me to participate today. I really appreciate the opportunity. So I'd point to a couple of through lines and then specific technology areas that I think are going to be really important to the U.S. over the next decade. The first really important through line for us is leadership in computing. Uh, the U.S. has enjoyed a very significant leadership position in computing, and increasingly in recent years, international competitors have risen up, China in particular, uh, to compete head-to-head -head with us in terms of computing at large scales. Computing is changing right now, though. So in addition to the U.S. investing in next-generation large-scale high-performance computing, exascale computing, for example, uh, we're also making significant investments in uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, data science, and future quantum technologies. You know, what's the next uh, track beyond the Moore's Law path we've been on for so long to really take the next step in computing? Um, I think we need to maintain a leadership position, and I say that for our economic competitiveness, but certainly from a national security perspective, these are critical underpinning technologies for everything we need to do. I think the second one, the U.S. needs to think seriously about the next manufacturing revolution. I think we've learned, particularly in the last two years, that uh, supply chains are fragile uh, and that simply relying on just-in-time delivery and global supply chains is really um, uncertain and unstable, uh, depending upon what's happening around the world. And so investments in advanced and additive manufacturing technologies, again, there's a strong nexus with computing tools, uh, using machine learning and AI to drive design optimization uh, and really improved efficiency in manufacturing, uh, working on the science of scale up, how to bring technologies rapidly from lab scale to the market, um, I think is a potential huge opportunity for the U.S. to establish a fundamentally new kind of manufacturing base. Um, I think the biosciences are the third through line. Turns out um, you're your health, everyone's health, is incredibly important to our economy, our national security. The reason we were able to have vaccines so fast this time is that decades of research on mRNA vaccines had preceded this moment. Mm -hmm. So we were ready as a scientific community to take that next step pretty quickly. For the next threat, you know, naturally occurring or engineered, it's not clear that we can respond on the time scale that's needed. And so again, application of the physical sciences, computing, engineering, building platforms to change fundamentally the way we think about design and testing of drugs that doesn't rely so much on long-term human testing, but builds really um, effective in silico and on a chip models of human organs so we can understand toxicity and efficacy quickly and then you know shorten the human trial cycle. And then I'll just point to the big opportunity, which is uh, the nexus of the need to adapt to and negate the effects of a changing climate and transform our energy sector. And so that means it's time to start deploying technologies for decarbonizing the environment, not just reducing emissions, but thinking about, you know, what are we going to do with the situation we're in currently and thinking about some potential blue sky opportunities. This was a big year for the fusion community. Uh, we put in place a few keystones at my lab. We demonstrated uh, arrived at the threshold of fusion ignition in the laboratory for the first time, demonstrating one of the key wow. enablers of potential fusion energy future. And the private sector is investing billions of dollars in potential uh, fusion energy pathways. So the moment is now for the U.S. to stake a claim uh, in this area and really leapfrog uh, with what would be a <clears throat> technology for the world. You know, before I, I turn to our other panelists, uh, Dr. Budell, I, for those who aren't familiar, perhaps, with NIF, the National Ignition Facility, I was there when it was just, you know, the, the dedication for the shovel. I mean, this is an incredible thing, size of football field. Could you just, you know, share a little bit about what this accomplishment is? <clears throat> sure. So 60 years ago, uh, one of our uh, researchers, who's still working with us, 
had an idea that you could create a controlled thermonuclear fusion in the laboratory using lasers to compress deuterium and tritium fuel, hydrogen fuel, uh, enough to cause those uh, atoms to fuse together. This is the process that fuels the sun. Uh, and for us as a national security lab, it's also a core process uh, that you could investigate with uh, core process in thermonuclear weapons. So we started on this path, and over the over the course of these many decades, we've created a series of increasingly more energetic laser facilities, culminating in the National Ignition Facility, which is the world's largest, most energetic laser. It produces 2.1 uh, or so uh, million joules of energy, 2.1 megajoules of energy, and it concentrates all that energy into a target that's about the size of my thumbnail, which contains a little tiny pellet it's about a millimeter in diameter containing that fusion fuel. So the trick is to get all that energy delivered to that little pellet of fusion fuel uh, accurately and quickly enough to cause the fusion process to take off. So this year we were able to produce 1.3 megajoules, so a target gain of 0.7 uh, at the facility, uh, demonstrating that this is feasible. There is a laboratory scale way to generate the conditions and that we need to get serious about what a fusion energy future might look like. Great, thank you. And I, I think, um, Greg, because energy is gonna be something <laughs> that's infusing all of this discussion on competitiveness, I might first ask Nolan to address some of the issues sure. from the perspective of, of a global manufacturer that's really at the forefront, yes, of design and delivering to consumers, but you are really, have been in the sustainability game way ahead you know, the curve. And so, you know, your thoughts on, first of all, what are the drivers for our competitiveness? But then let's get in a little bit more to, to your particular leadership. As yeah, a manufacturer. I don't know if we're quite as exciting as fusion, but uh, I think appliances is a pretty cool space. And uh, mm -hmm. we're a hundred year old company. Frigidaire is one of the brands you might know, and Electrolux is a big global appliance brand. And, you know, we have invested almost a billion dollars in the in the last couple three years on um, u.s manufacturing so building new factories because fundamentally the way we've built appliances in the past in the way we've manufactured in the past just doesn't work anymore you know leveraging uh, uh, older technology we can't compete and what we weren't doing was also leveraging i, I like the lead in we were not leveraging our group across the globe and it, you know if you look at a consumer at the very least, they're eighty-five percent the same across the, the, the world in, in the appliance space. They want to make great meals for their family. They want to save time. You know, they 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 want to spend it with their family and accomplish tasks successfully. So, we decided the only way that uh, we could position ourselves in the next hundred years is to, you know, on those common problems, level, leverage a common global architecture, common global modules. So we could quickly, if we see something that, that solves a problem across the world, we can we can deploy it here as opposed to starting from scratch. So common interfaces, common solutions, uh, working together as a group on problems, and then understanding that there's some differences, 15%, you know, 10% differences that, you know, size, shape of appliances. So, you know, we're building very automated, very sustainable because our, our, at a foundation of our company's sustainability, we believe in it, we believe the, the the world's running out of resources and we need to be very thoughtful about it. And we believe we have to be a part of the solution. So, you know, one, our, our new new factories, I was in a factory yesterday in Anderson's 40% 40, 40 less energy than the factory that was next door. But, you know, it's great. It makes us more competitive. It's very automated factory. And as we've changed what, uh, you know, if you think, the thoughts I have on competitiveness in the U.S. is the workforce we, we have to be an active participant in training our workforce, how to be more automated, uh, how to work with equipment, how to uh, you know have better paying jobs, better skilled. And, and I do think there's a gap. There's a gap. I think it's harder to find people that are able to, you know, in Italy, we've used these factories that work in Italy. I think there's a, there's a bigger trade feeder into our manufacturing. So we're, we're setting up training centers and training, but I do think that's a, that's a really important part. And, you know, yesterday we had schools in the, in the factory because trade schools, colleges, high schools, we have to make, we have to make manufacturing a, a compelling place to come and work. And if they don't want to, to go to college or if they do, and they want to come develop appliances, but uh, this manufacturing competitiveness 
in, in education and I think sustainability because we have to do it. We have to lead and we have to build good appliances that are sustainable in your life, but we have to build them in a way that's sustainable. So uh, for us, this, you know, you said a few things, but I think in, in, in the base manufacturing, it's education, getting the right employees, it's localizing our supply chain. We've become much simpler, <clears throat> but we were exposed. So I think we have to shorten our, our supply chain and or have redundancy on some of these critical things because ultimately we have to simplify into more meaningful solutions. But uh, that exposed us a little bit. And I think there'll be some, there, I could talk, I could talk and talk about it, but uh, the world's changing for us. And I don't think it changed because of the pandemic. I just think it accelerated very quickly. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. And we're gonna come back to these questions that have, or comments that have emerged, but um, Greg, Energy is the lifeblood of the economy. Don't we know that? Um, we've known it. Right. It's here today. The cost of U.S. energy in recent years, you know, has been two to three times lower than that of many of our competitors and partners in the world, um, due in no small part to the fact of innovation that enabled horizontal drilling and fracking and unleashing, you know, mm -hmm. our, our energy reserves. You, you've been a tremendous leader in the energy business mm -hmm. and the gas resolution. And, and I've learned from working with you on the commission, you're doing amazing things in carbon capture and sequestration and, and mm -hmm. also at the forefront of the, the clean energy revolution. So energy writ large, the, the floor is yours. Yeah. So, well, well thank you, everyone. Um, you know, I, I can't think of a more important topic to be talking about right now, um, you know, given current events and the obvious atrocities that are going on in the Ukraine. So, Clearly, my colleagues talked about, you know, many of the factors that I, I agree with for competitiveness, but unfortunately, all that depends upon energy, right? So, um, you know, clearly, you know, in order for a rapid recovery and, and future U.S. competitiveness, it's, it's continued access to reliable, affordable um, energy. Um, you know, and, and as Ukraine starkly illustrates, I think, you know, national security, economic prosperity, these are all shaped by energy independence. And, you know, for the first time in 67 years, in 2019, the U.S. was energy independent. And, uh, you know, you've already intimated some of those advantages. Um, you know, uh, that that enabled families and businesses to reduce their cost by about 25 percent between 2008 and 2020. And as you mentioned, Deborah, you know, U.S. consumers pay two to three times less for energy as their European counterparts. Um, so, you know, renewing American energy leadership to me is absolutely critical, you know, to be the stabilizing force to stay competitive, but also support our allies overseas. Now, you know, as Kimberly mentioned, you know, we also have to move, you know, to an orderly and just energy transition. So, um, you know, so we need to not only continue to capitalize upon the resources that we have, produce them cleaner, uh, but also uh, heavily invest, uh, you know, in technology and innovation uh, to, to try and figure out those those future energy sources that are going to be much cleaner. You know, American can and should lead the world, um, you know, in this endeavor. And, you know, the oil industry can help, we're, you know, we're part of the solution. We have a track record of being innovators. But I also think the other way that most Americans don't think about that the industry can help is, you know, that the government derives an awful lot of income from oil and gas. So if you look at, um, you know, we've sent hundreds of billions of dollars to the Treasury. Hopefully some of that has gone to Livermore. And the state treasuries alone in the last two years have received over $20 billion, you know, in the form of severance taxes and whatnot from the industry. So, you know, this notion of energy independence on the existing forms, but also how do we get energy independence and leadership in the news? You know, that is absolutely job number one, kind of the moonshot that I think the United States should undertake. And we can do it. Thank you. Um, you know, what I want you to be thinking about, because we're going to kind of, as we come to the end of our session, um, I'm go we, I want to have everybody really kind of give their thoughts. What would they think are the three to four elements of mm -hmm. a national competitiveness strategy coming out of 
the COVID pandemic. And of course, all of you, you know, who are so active in the Council on Competitiveness work, you know, in our uh, National Commission, uh, a year or so ago, our, our flagship report, Competing in the Next Economy, the New Age of Innovation, I mean, we called for increasing the number of innovations we develop and deploy tenfold, mm -hmm. increasing by tenfold the speed at which we innovate, and tenfold the number of Americans engaged in innovation. And many of our recommendations are in the legislation that I've mentioned. So we'll put that just a little bit going, you know, as we as we move towards the end. But I'd like to ask everyone now, you know, we've all talked about the workforce and talent and people. And what are some of the things that in your respective domains you're doing right now to address this issue of having, you know, a developed trained workforce that's obviously digitally literate and has the skills to participate in your enterprise? And and yeah, maybe I'll just again come around and start with you because you you have to recruit the best and brightest, you know, physicists and scientists and engineers in the world to, to work at Livermore. Yep, physicists, chemists, biologists, material <coughs> scientists, engineers, technicians, uh, project managers, you know, a whole range of skills. Uh, so we're doing many things. Traditionally, for our focus on our S&T um, workforce, which we recruit internationally, uh, we work on partnerships with major research universities, uh, trying to build relationships with researchers in key areas that, that we work in uh, to encourage the best students to come and spend summers with us, learn about what a national lab is like. It's very difficult to explain our environment to someone without them seeing it. And so giving them a sense of the scale at which we work, the kind of team science that we do, uh, the kind of very rare opportunities that a national lab can offer is really important. So we do a lot of student internships, uh, increasingly focused on ensuring that um, underrepresented minority students and women students in STEM fields get those opportunities uh, as well, because diversifying the pipeline is really important in those realms. And because our workforce is so large and disciplinarily diverse, uh, we have a real opportunity to make significant movements on that front. Uh, we also have programs for younger students, high school students and younger, where we try to instill in them excitement about the kind of science that we do. Uh, we've been using a lot of our early career researchers to go out and do those programs. That's a great way to build excitement about science, to have exciting scientists come out and talk to you. Uh, we have a Science on Saturday lecture series, for example, where we work, our researchers work with a local high school teacher uh, to put on a long-form lecture for the community to talk about you know, interesting things in science and help raise scientific literacy. But increasingly, we're building partnerships with our community colleges and our veteran community to establish new kinds of training programs. You know, we're really working hard to hire folks who have skills in um, technology, machining, uh, skilled trades, you know, all of the things that enable us to do the kind of work that we do. And that is not as prevalent in the community. There's been a big focus on uh, traditional higher ed and a much less focus on building a skilled workforce uh, in these um, technology heavy disciplines, IT specialists, machinists, uh, technologists, you know, there's a whole host of realms where you don't necessarily need uh, an advanced degree, but you do need a high degree of technical skill. So again, community colleges have been an incredible partnership and for us, we've really tapped into our uh, veteran pipeline. Many of them have developed skills during their time in the military that are directly translatable into our environment. Uh, and they really resonate with our national service uh, focus for our community. So it's a competitive market out there. We're really working on all fronts. Thank, thank you for mentioning, you know, the, the skilled trades, because, you know, at the Council on Competitiveness, one of our unique... Uh, sets of members are the labor unions, the presidents and the CEOs of our labor unions. And I, I know back to NIF, um, when I was there some years ago, United Association, you know, all the skilled labor that built NIF, the pipes, the plumbing are all from the pipe fitters and plumbers, one of the, our great skilled unions and president of the Electrical Union of America is on our board. So the skilled trades are critical and they're critical in for for Nolan and for um, Greg in your work. So. Maybe we'll start with you, Greg, and then Nolan this time on kind of the workforce skilled uh, trade issues, but your concerns about building the talent that you need going forward. 
Sure. So, you know, before I do that, you know, what I'd like to do is kind of address your first question and I'll do it very quickly. But, you know, and that was your notion of what, you know, what should a national competitiveness strategy look like? Right. And, you know, I think there's some I think there's some really key components of it. Um, and I'm going to, you know, no surprise, I'm going to say it should start with an energy policy first. And to me, that energy policy ought to be one of, you know, American um, independence in all forms. You know, why is China building 90 percent of our solar you know, panel components shouldn't be like that. We should lead in that, um, you know, as an example of a new form of energy. Um, I think the second mo- really important thing is, you know, as part of this strategy is is an innovation strategy to lower the carbon footprint of our existing resources because we have enough resources in oil and gas, you know, and other forms to last a couple hundred years. That will give us the needed time, you know, for the research, technology, innovation on all the other things. And then obviously this, the third's got to be massive investment in new innovation um, to, to really ensure this orderly, just transition. And they say just because, remember, we have to be able to pull, you know, a lot of people out of poverty in the world as well. And so that low cost energy is really important uh, to do that. And it's got to be very aggressive because, you know, if you've read Bill Gates's book on how to avoid a climate change disaster, you know, he talks about half the technology that's going to be required to get kind of a carbon neutral world hadn't even been invented yet. So, you know, this is going to be a long challenge, a very hard and very expensive challenge. A couple of other things I think we have to do is fourth, we got to educate everyone on this energy transition. And that's the public and the politicians in the reality of what it means. And we really got to make sure decision makers are literate in climate, they're literate in energy, and they're literate in economics. Um, And, you know, Kim already mentioned STEM. Boy, we got to get, we got to get that back. You know, STEM's got to be like the number one, one of the number one degrees that people want to go achieve. And it doesn't have to be you know, the four-year college degree, it can be the technical side as well, you know, but but science, technology, engineering, and math is going to be the lifeblood of this. And then the last thing I'm going to say is, for God's sakes, bring us together, yes. you know, form these, you know, comprehensive cooperative partnerships between academia, government, and business. We've done it before. We've, we've overcome these incredible challenges. Um, by working together, not throwing rocks at each other, not demonizing each other, but actually pulling together to to do the moonshot. Um, and, you know, I'm facing the same workforce challenges everyone else facing. The world's getting more technical, more complicated. We, we overinvest in our workforce, really trying to uh, have them keep pace, you know, with technology. So, um so that was kind of my thoughts on just the competitive uh, strategy. Um, thank you. That was fantastic. And, yeah. and, and, and Nolan, um, maybe on the workforce and then lead into the, the strategy issues too, as, as we see our time, unfortunately, coming um, closer to the end here. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, such good lead-ins. I don't think I, I could add much more to that conversation. I think you can, uh, as we uh, all yeah. more. a little more, a little more. Yeah, can. <laughs> and, uh, I think it starts with two that we've always challenged ourselves. We have to be a good place to work. And, uh, you know, so when we get people, we need to keep people. And uh, some, some things I think are important there. When when you talked about, you know, energy independence, getting on the same page, that's right. I mean, we, we are in a, a workplace that people want to work for a purpose-driven company. People want to want to be inspired by their company. They want a company that does good things. And uh, there are some indisputable things like we have more people on the earth and we have to be more responsible so we can we can get divided. You know, I come from from a, a ranch and family in Texas. We can get divided on the issue of sustainability. But I think there's so many more things that we're 100 percent aligned on, Absolutely. which is, you know, the earth's sacred place. Resources are really good. We care about it. People care about how they spend their resources and how they spend their money. They want to do good things. So I think this commonality of being a purpose-driven company uh, is, is a good start. And then engaging our employees in solving our problems and understanding how they solve. You know, what do we do? What does Electrolux do? And how are you a part of it? So whether it's a worker on the line, they need to run 
the factory. They understand using lean yeah, principles exactly what's wrong or right. The days of the expert walking around telling you what's wrong and right. It's, it's employee has to be the expert and understand how they, they do it. And I think it's so, so critical because people want better jobs. They want to they wanna do well. And we just have to give them a path. And they, so often we lead poorly and we shut it off. Mm-hmm. And even when we go get trade people, they don't like working where we're at. They're not inspired to do better. And I think there's so much that we can do as leaders to open up, you know, just a general motivation. We'll keep people. They'll want to learn because they they are inspired by what we do. And I think this is every day kind of, we make more of a difference than ever right now. Thank you. And, you know, on, on what you're doing to build, you know, energy efficiency and productivity in a sustainable way into the production of your appliances as, as well as the intelligence now. I mean, you're really at the forefront of using a lot of these uh, needs and capabilities for the future. And so do you find that your workforce um, is eager to contribute to that strategy that you've been, I mean, it's a tremendous business strategy that's given you differentiations in the markets because people want your products for all those reasons. Yeah, well, for, for years we thought that, uh, that you had to be sensitive on how you talked about it. you couldn't be bold. You, we wish, you know, you people get upset about it. And we were all wrong. I mean, when, when we when we engage around sustainability, we have people sign up for the committees and the tasks. We've done a really nice job. We're proud. We're 84% there on our way to be carbon neutral by 2030. Not 2035, 2030. Uh, it just gets harder and harder. But... Uh, and, and we're, we're building appliances in a way, really, in your life. That, you know, if you save, if you save, you know, electric or you save electricity in your fridge, great. But if you keep your vegetables longer, they're also most more nutritious. People save money. And food waste, as we've talked about in the Council of Competitiveness, is eliminated. If you clean your clothes better by using less detergent, by premixing the detergent with water, they are cleaner. They're brighter. They last longer. You save money. There's not these hard trade-offs mm-hmm. that, that we put put in front of us. There's so many good things. So we we engage on that. That s- s- sustainability is just making us more innovative. And, and we just have to lean into it in this technology and what we can do to the consumer. But what we weren't doing is our own facilities leading a culture of sustainability. And you couldn't feel it. And then that actually is something we're saying, okay, you can't feel what we're doing here. And we have to be better in every way because then we engage the employee's passion around it. And it's, mm-hmm. it is strong, especially with people coming into the workforce right now. And you've all mentioned this, you know, concept, you know, obviously decarbonization, but dematerialization as well and, and the life cycle in a sustainable way. You know, um, Kim, I, I, I want to give you, a, again, an opportunity to talk a little bit you know, beyond the workforce, you've mentioned the, the critical importance of the, the R&D investments. But in your re- comments, could you, you mean, you were really doing things amazingly uh, advanced in your partnerships because you you can't do your work without a matrix organization. You don't have stovepipes and how the work gets done. And that leads you into being a partnership DNA organization, really. So I think um, fundamentally the nature of the research ecosystem is changing. I think both Greg and Nolan have hit on parts of this and I'll just use the climate and energy transition as an example to illustrate it. So if you think about changing the energy mix in the US, uh, the most significant factor driving that is gonna be economics, right? Mm -hmm. Energy is delivered by the private sector, not the government. Uh, And so you have to find a way to bring innovative new technologies to bear in a way that's going to be cost effective and um, economically viable. The second part is you want to bring everyone along. So, you know, it's a fundamental uh, goal in the United States that we would like all our citizens to benefit from the fruits of public research. Uh, And so we want to make sure that communities that uh, might be disadvantaged in this transition or might, you know, be left behind because they have roots in the old energy economy uh, that we're working actively with those communities to transition them to the new energy economy. And I'll just talk about transitions in oil and gas communities over time. You know, as oil and gas uh, resources are depleted, that same infrastructure can be used to store carbon underground. Mm -hmm. So you can begin thinking about ways to position those communities, partnerships between 
oil and gas companies, local communities, national labs, academic partners, philanthropies, to build um, very new and novel types of public-private partnerships that, that take account of bringing people along, helping them understand the types of technologies we're talking about deploying, what that means for them, looking for solutions that work in their communities, not you know the usual. <laughs> you may have noticed this at the national labs. We're really <laughs> smart, so we know exactly what you need. Um, very different, very different. And we're, we're building those types of partnerships. Um, my focus on climate adaptation and mitigation is not a sense that we don't want to stem emissions, but a reality-based assessment. You know, the climate is changing now. There's a lot of carbon in the environment. Things are going to happen and we need to prepare communities for those things. So again, mm -hmm. this is not something I can do by myself. My lab can do the government can do in isolation. We need to work with private sector entities, with local communities, with states, uh, with philanthropic sources, and and build partnerships uh, to address the changes we're seeing now. And so I live in California. We're a living lab for this, right? If there's a bad outcome, we're living it somewhere, right? Rising seas, dropping water tables, wildfires, extreme weather events. Um, you know, there's an opportunity here you know, a huge agricultural sector, large urban areas. We have every, you know, type of ecosystem that's needed. And so for me, starting to pilot some of these new types of partnerships, really taking technology out in the field and seeing what we can do. You know, I'm really heartened by how achievable carbon neutrality is, given the technology we have in hand right now. And with continued investments in basic and applied research, there'll be even more over the next decades. So mm -hmm. it's just a really exciting moment in time to make something happen that will demonstrate that there is a path forward that won't undermine our economy, will provide these benefits and will put us on a more sustainable path to the future. You know, that great. And I, you know, partnerships are what we have to do in competitiveness in all dimensions, whether it's the talent, mm -hmm. it's the technology, <clears throat> infrastructure, the investment. And, you know, we've, we think of sustainability in the environmental context, but it's really sustainability writ large, sustainability of our community, sustainability of our investments, you know, having a, a sustainable regulatory environment that doesn't shift and change whoever, you know, comes in as an administration and business needs certainty and they need to be able to invest in the long term. And I have to say on the issue, you know, of the digital revolution, the digital underpinning, the, the emergence of real time AI and economy and all of this. I, I was so heartened when the president and the state of the union called out Intel for making this incredible investment in next generation uh, microelectronics and its production in Ohio. Um, that's that is a watershed turn in the United States. And so um, I want to get us in our last yeah. few minutes here. And, and, and Greg, before we do leave, I want you to highlight, you know, what we're going to be doing out in, in, in Wyoming, which is very much at the heart of this. Let's talk a little bit about place-based innovation. We cannot continue to have these pockets of great innovation capability in the East Coast, the West Coast, and not bring all of that into the death and breadth of our country, where we make things, where we educate, all of that. And I'll just give one example, you know. Uh, an emerging uh, AI leader, data robots, doing incredible things, training an AI data capability in West Virginia in the healthcare arena. We're seeing companies now purposely going to parts of the country where even five years ago they said, no, we're going to be in Silicon Valley, we're going to be in Boston, mm -hmm. etc. So place-based innovation is one of the highest priorities going forward for our country and competitiveness. So whoever wants to jump in first on that, please do. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in briefly. I apologize, gentlemen, only because it's related to what I was talking about. And yeah. note two things. One is that I had just met Patrick Gelsinger before he appeared at the State of the Union, and you know he's talking about fabs based on extreme ultraviolet lithography, which is the next generation technology, which was invented at the GOE National Labs, right? So again, public investment, long term horizon, really mm -hmm. important. Place-based is very important. I mentioned the California um, uh, combination of unique types of communities. You know, we're working with uh, partners in the Bakersfield area, Kern County, uh, which has a large oil and gas footprint to create just the kind of partnership I'm talking about. 
you know, can mm -hmm. we build an economy around carbon capture and sequestration in this uh, community that has a very strong oil and gas footprint? So begin this, you know, pilot scale. We know how to do this work, but begin this transition in this community, working in close partnership with the state, with the local community, with the local universities, Cal State Bakersfield, uh, with uh, other campuses in the UC system to really demonstrate the power of place-based innovation. And DOE has made that a centerpiece of their um, deployment strategy, really focusing on place-based uh, innovation and deployment of new. Nolan, <laughs> thank you, Kim. Yes, I just think so. so critical to have these partnerships and, uh, you know, it, it just, it makes so much sense for us. And um, one, to, to and, and to share those innovations as we do it and just deploy them. And the decisions where you're putting mm -hmm. your manufacturing operations as well has been both strategic, but you're also expanding your footprint throughout the country and, and North America. We are expanding our investment, but what we have found <laughs> is that, for instance, we built a new refrigeration plant right next to where we had a refrigeration plant. And uh, it was a more modern plant. We moved the same employees because in the past we had moved these and we just lost our, our greatest talent, which were employees. So we're able to leverage that. But we also had a lot of university partnerships, Clemson, for instance, Anderson University the, and uh, trade schools in the area that uh, we engaged in problems like uh, you know, taste and food loss and nutritional and what happens when you store food and and, and what do people proceed? You know, how do they, how do we store food? How do we have partnerships with, with package companies that, you know, food is their inventory. So when we can apply those things, so we get the edge, the universities who have, who have agricultural and uh, food-based food science programs, as opposed to technology based innovation, where how do you make a better refrigerator? Let's start to think about what's in the refrigerator and the food science. And the universities are so far ahead of us, and, and uh, our local partnerships are so, so important. Thank you. And in our time coming to an end, and I want to thank everybody on the chat that's had fabulous questions, and we can, you know, reach out with people afterwards. But in the last minutes we have here, um, Greg, we, we are moving forward with an incredible regional uh, innovation activity in Wyoming that you're leading uh, with the president of the University of Wyoming and the director of Idaho National Lab. Just share with us a little bit about that and the preview of issues. And and we're really looking at the, the uh, northern mountain states as an innovation hotspot going forward. Right. So thank you. You know, look, I was uh, born and raised in the great state of Wyoming. Um, I'd like to say that's part of why it's there, but it's not. I just uh, we just happen to coalesce on Wyoming as a place to have it. The two big topics are really what we talked about today: um, place-based innovation. So, how do you get, say, the heartland of America more participative in you know the innovation technology space and the uh, you know and where the world is headed, particularly in energy transition? And then we're also going to talk about the energy transition and and kind of what it's going to take. And, I, you know, I just really want to highlight one, you know, the, the point I made earlier that I think is so important. We have such a huge challenge just educating everyone on this energy transition and what it's going to take. You know, it's going to take a lot of time. You know, I'll give you an example. Just to electrify the transportation sector in the U.S. is going to require us to triple or quadruple the size of the current grid. In order to do that, you've got to get consumers and the public on board with you or it's going to be NIMBY everywhere, right? You know, it's going to cost a lot of money. You've got to get the investment community behind this as well and the government because, you know, IEA says in their sustainable development scenario, we got to invest $450 billion a year just in conventional energy in the next 20 years, which is about 150% of what we did last year. And three trillion a year for the next twenty years in clean energy, and that's three hundred percent of what we invested in twenty twenty. Um, so I think people just understanding these realities is part of the change journey, and and that's one of the things we aim to do. You know, in Laramie is hopefully begin to have these more holistic conversations about what it's going to take, but. 
you know, I'm an optimist. Um, you know, we can do this. We all pull together and put our minds to it. And I think it could be a story of American leadership once again. Thank you. And I, I, I want to thank all of you because not only are, are you great American leaders, but you are thought innovators and you're walking the road. You're doing things that are transforming our country and contributing to the world and, and really taking us on this journey of what competitiveness is about. It's delivering inclusive prosperity and security to all our citizens. And so um, I look forward to continuing all the work we're doing with you and others. And again, I apologize to those on our chat. We had a lot of questions that actually I wove in and I want to thank you. And we are being recorded so everyone can come back. And we I know we will be happy to communicate directly with any of, of you that are there. And so I want to thank Frank uh, Jurgen Richter for his leadership of Horasis. It's an incredible community. And I know we're hoping next year to, to be back together in, in Portugal for the Global Summit in Cascais and um, wish you all a, a great remaining day and to continue these wonderful discussions um, of the Horasis uh, U.S. Summit. And thank you, uh, Council on Competitiveness leaders and partners for, for your wonderful contributions today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.